Welcome to the Writers Center's virtual craft chat series, where we talk with writers a little less about what they wrote and a little bit more about how they wrote it. Uh, my name is Zach Powers. I'm the artistic director at the Writers Center, but I'm also a fiction writer, which is why I get the, the, the joy and the pleasure of, of emceeing this chat tonight and talking with Philip Dean Walker. Um, so Phil, welcome, welcome. I do just want Thank to you. invite you as we begin, if you have a brief excerpt of your book to share with the crowd, I, first of all, you're one of my favorite out loud readers in all of literature. And also I want to make sure, make sure anyone who doesn't know your work has a taste of what they're, they're what we'll be talking about. Well, thank you for the intro, Zach. I'm so happy to be here. Um, yeah, I do have a little selection. I'll just read a little bit. Um, I can get carried away, so <laughs> just stop me. Um, this is the beginning of the third story in the book, which is called Elizabeth Regina. It was any stage actor's worst nightmare. Elizabeth had forgotten her next line. Maureen had just said her line, and now it was Elizabeth's turn to say hers. But she had no idea what it was. The two were on stage playing sisters-in-law in Lillian Hellman's the Little Foxes at the Eisenhower Theater at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, as part of a series of out-of-town previews. Elizabeth could tell from the look in Maureen's eyes that Maureen knew she didn't know the line. Come on, Liz, she seemed to encourage her. You can do it. Do her. Do Regina. Playing Regina Hubbard Giddens in The Little Foxes marked Elizabeth's stage debut, and she'd had to work so hard at memorizing all those lines. Regina has the most out of anyone else in the play. There is hardly a moment when she isn't on the stage. It had all been a shocking revelation for Elizabeth, even though of course she had known all this before rehearsals began. She knew intellectually that she couldn't she wouldn't be able to yell cut and do the scene over again. But here, right in the meat of it, it was so much worse than she could have imagined. Early on in rehearsals, Elizabeth had found it helpful to use a hook from the line of the character who had had the line before hers to trigger her own line. And that had mostly worked, but it didn't work as she couldn't hear the line that came before hers, which is exactly what had happened tonight. Someone had coughed loudly during Maureen's last line and Elizabeth had missed the tail end of it completely. So there she was, arrested in a turn of the century living room set, shoveled into a hot beaded garnet gown, looking at Maureen with absolutely nothing to say. There are ways out of this, Elizabeth thought. She smiled at Maureen in that sly kind of way she had crafted for Regina. She crossed down stage right and busied herself with the crystal decanter at the bar cart. She tipped a little of the liquid into her goblet, unsweetened weak tea that was passing for brandy, and then threw it back. Elizabeth had suggested to the director that they do a drunk rehearsal one day to see what would happen, much to the younger cast members' enthusiasm. Elizabeth, we don't have enough insurance on you to cover anything like falling off the stage in a stupor, the director had said. This was fair. She had a documented history of walking off sets, demanding extra fees, trashing her dressing rooms, calling in sick, refusing to work for the first two days of her menstruation. It wasn't easy being her. And sometimes that job necessitated a day off. But this, was, but this play was on its way to Broadway and she was a newcomer there. She didn't want to do any of that stuff anymore. It wouldn't be respectful, and she wanted their respect. Elizabeth was a United States Senator's wife now. The president and the first lady were in the audience tonight. She was playing the leading lady in a classic play. It was 1981. This was a new decade, and Elizabeth would reflect that. Thank you so, so much. So when you mentioned the, the couldn't hear something because of cough, I hope my, my cat trying to expel a hairball was not uh, caught on the microphone there. I had to mute myself for <laughs> or, a minute. Or maybe it was just perfectly cued up. Exactly. <laughs> oh, 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 the joys of these times. Uh, so just real quickly in your own words, who the heck are you? 
Wow. Um, so I am uh, a writer. Um, I live in Washington, D.C. This is my third book. Um, I, I feel like I... I'm just learning every day. Like I hope to learn something during this craft hour too. I, I just, I just, I love the kind of evolving nature of the work. I mean, it's just, and, and also how each project is just so different from the last project. Um, and I know you, you can understand that like more than anyone, just um, we both have like books that are very different from each other. Um, and I, I think that's just really, um, a testament to kind of try the try anything vibe, which is, I that's really my, um, that's sort of my, gonna be my mantra um, is to, to dare. Um, Cause I, even if you fail, you, at least you've tried. And if you don't fail, you'll succeed with something that no one else can do and no one else did, you know? Um, so yep, I um, just a writer in his forties <laughs> plodding along, um, but I'm, I'm very glad to be here. I feel like that, this is a support group for writers, writers in their forties. So that's what we're <laughs> yeah. um, and, and it's interesting too, because I mean, even within, so, so we have Better Davis, which is in fact, sort of a continuation of what you were doing in At Dance Ateria, which was your first book. And also I love like that these books, like they are the same size. They, yeah. anyway, I really love these books on my shelf. They make me very happy when I put them across my bookshelf. Yeah, they look good together. Um, but even within, I mean, these are unified and maybe we'll get to that in a minute, uh, but individual stories in there, some of the stories are more closely related in terms of style and execution than others, but there's some that depart from, there's not a formula that you're just sticking to for all these stories. So right. even though we're set, uh, uh, so these are, not stories about the AIDS epidemic, but they're set where that was going on around the stories and feature characters yes. who often were uh, uh, were there. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I get, let, let's let's start with that question because that, that's one, one that's really interesting to me. Is mm -hmm. these both these books are are set in this cultural historical moment, and you've been working on these stories for I don't know how long, but I know at least five years, and I suspect years before that as well. So. Probably 10 years, 2011, I think is when I wrote the first one. So, so exactly, yeah, we're right at 10 years. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So a decade of these stories. Yeah. Um, what's changed for you as a writer from story one to the most recent story? And what's changed in how you write those stories? Interesting. Yeah, it's so funny because the first story I wrote in this series was really just by accident. I wasn't even setting off on this big project to collect all these stories. It was just, you know, I literally had a story due in class like the night before. Um, and that's why actually the first story I wrote for this collection is so short. <laughs> um, it's it's like three, four pages, which is the title story of At Danceteria, um, which had a horrible title before that, by the way. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I felt, I wrote that first story and then I, I saw, you know, a little news piece about a celebrity moment that happened in the eighties that kind of had a little, you know, Susan of, of relevance to what I'd written before. So that became another one and they just sort of started building. Um, and what's, what's interesting is, and I think the writing of this book compared to Danceteria was, you know, I didn't know that at, at Danceteria while I was writing those first four or so stories was even going to be a book. So I was just publishing them as these one-off things that were kind of like in the same vein, but um, hadn't been necessarily like choreographed as this, this linked collection. Um, so when I started writing Better Davis, which I, I started writing it actually three months before At Danceteria even came out, um, I kind of already knew that there were more stories I wanted to tell. Um, so because I knew that Better Davis was going to be a book, um, I the stories feel a little bit more consciously linked, I think you'll notice, um, especially the first four stories. Like each story has a little bit of the last one in some way, um, even if it's just like Jim J. Bullock thinking, you know, I feel like Natalie Wood in Splendor in the Grass. And then like, you know, the next story is about Natalie Wood. Um, and just, you know, so I think the book 
feels a little bit different from um, at Danceteria. It, at least it does to me in a way, but I think they do, you know, very much complement each other. And I think I, I said this in the, um, this inter the, the interview that we had uh, a couple months ago, but I feel like Better Davis sort of completes the project that I started with at Danceteria. Um, Cause it, I really wanted to get to a, like a little bit of a more emotional level um, in this book. And I, I think it goes there. Um, so it's more of a balance than just, oh, here are six more stories. You know, I think it really, yeah, maybe, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I believe you're correct. I know, I, I see that. I, I, yeah. This is sort of an off the cuff question is, you mentioned the emotional impact. And I think like a skill that you exhibit in all these stories is the emotional impact, but also paired with the skill of an entertainer. And, and I say that with respect as someone who started their life in the performing arts and, and came to, like, how, how do you, how do you think of yourself as a writer? Do you, do you have that idea of entertaining people in mind at the same time as we talk a lot in writing about the emotional impact, right. we don't talk as nearly as much, at least in literary fiction about the ride. Right. How, how, you know, do you think about the ride along the way and, and how you deliver that, that emotional impact? Well, you know, I, I guess I do. Um, I think dialogue for me has become really like important. I feel like there's just more dialogue in these stories than um, my other work, maybe not, I don't know. But I, I think for, for instance, the first story, very special episode, you know, there's a man sitting in a waiting room waiting for his, you know, HIV results, basically. They didn't have, they weren't calling it HIV yet, but like it, it's a, it's a very tense moment. It's a very tense situation. So rather than dive full into that, the writing of that story is, we're going to talk about everything but that, um, because the, the author is just sort of like, and, and it starts creeping in a little bit at first and then it totally takes over. Um, but in a way, the funny kind of humor that that story starts with is, um, I would say, not for the purposes of entertaining at that point, but more the purpose of distracting the mm -hmm. reader. Because, um, you know, I'm going to take you to the dark places later in the book, but I kind of want to, I, um, I, I kind of like starting a little bit with a little bit of a, you know, humor or just a regular scene or um, some some dialogue between characters that's kind of, you know, funny. I, I don't know. It, it just, it felt like in that story particularly useful to um, go everywhere because the character kind of experiences every um, emotion during that story, um, even if it's just remembering emotions from the, his past. So, I mean, I always want to, I don't know if I'm an inner, I want to entertain necessarily. I guess I do. Um, it's it's sort of like if it if it ends up being entertaining, great. Um, but for me, the 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 it's uh, I'm always beholden to the actual story. I'm not beholden to the reader. You know, mm -hmm. I don't really care if you're entertained. <laughs> it's great if you are, but I this this in this particular instance, the story needed that entertaining kind of clownishness to mm -hmm. outweigh what were some very heavy things happening in it. Mm -hmm. That makes How sense. You, yeah, yeah, absolutely. How do you, um, as you're writing a story, think, thinking of, of what you were just saying a little bit, mm -hmm. how do you have a sense of whether or not the story, at, in the, as you're writing it, whether or not it's sort of succeeding and moving towards a goal? Do you have a sense of that as you write? Or is it just, you know, until, until you yeah. reach a stopping point? Or do you sort of like, oh, this is going somewhere? I feel it, I think you just kind of feel it naturally. Um, and I always get to that moment and then I instantly start looking at the whole picture and seeing what I can cut. Um, and just, cause I, I just feel like I, there's just this, that's sort of the sculpting part of it. But, you know, you just have to sort of be open to go anywhere. Like when I was writing the, the that first story I was telling you about, None of that stuff about him, you know, he ends up, he's in the waiting room getting his, waiting for his results. And he ends up seeing a video that they're playing where it's like an instructional video and he recognizes one of the actors in it. And so that sort of, 
But you know, when I set out to write that scene, that just popped in. And then that became a whole like motif through the first third of the story. Um, so I, I just love the idea of just waiting for those little things to happen. Um, and it's so funny because it, it something something different will ha- like something will happen when you sit down to write that would never have happened at any other moment. So it's you know it, it's like this just catching fire in a bottle kind of thing. Sometimes I mean sometimes you write like complete shit and it's just <laughs> you need to just cut it. Um, or that complete shit took you to a good place. Um, and then you like hack it off and it's like, oh, no one even knows that <laughs> what preceded that. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I, I do. I think the shape of these stories in particular is very important because it, there's so much um, that the re- there's so much that the reader knows that the characters don't that has to be kind of reckoned with. Um, when writing the stories. And I, I, I want to treat the readers respectfully. That's why I'm not like starting the story and be like, I'm Elizabeth Taylor, this is my story. It's like, you know, you might not even realize it is Elizabeth Taylor until, you know, a couple of pages in and have that little fun joy of that. Um, it's trusting your reader a lot, I think. I mean, first of all, I love that technique. I, th- I think that's a technique that can be discussed is you don't have to give the reader everything right away. No. Usually bad idea to, keep, to deliberately keep secrets from the reader, like keeping important information, but this it's actually not important in that story to know it's Elizabeth Taylor until later. Not yet, exactly. exactly. That's, not, that, that's not a secret. That's just like, you enjoy the story thoroughly until you realize, I mean, and- Oh. <laughs> and, and, there's, and also it gives a wonderful sense of suspicion. Mm-hmm. Like, as you go along, the suspicions, the details, the more familiar you are with, with the real person, then the more likely you are to catch on. So it, it works in particular with the fact that you're writing sort of historical fiction, imagining these characters and their thoughts. So anyway, that's a really effective uh, thing. Second thing I want to you said something in the middle there, which I, I loved and I've not heard it said quite that way, is like that when you sit down to write, things happen that won't happen. You said it better than I'm saying it right now, but when you sit down to write, things will happen there that won't happen elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's a much more interesting variation than that you got to sit down and write. Yeah. I meant like, you got to sit down and write, not because you have to sit down and write to produce work, but because the act of writing itself is a process separate from everything else. Unless you're in that act, you're not going to create the thing that's going to resonate as writing. So exactly. uh, right. I'm filing that away for future use. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, take it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so just, just, uh, there's a one and I question. will say one, one additional yeah. thing about that was, um, one of the things that I really try very hard in these stories is to not ever rely on the bold face nature and the fame and just the things that you already know about the characters that I, I want to kind of find the, the person inside, um, like the human, like the, 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 the whatever. So in that story that, Elizabeth Taylor is experiencing like a very human um, moment and it really doesn't even matter that it's Elizabeth Taylor. It's like just an actor on stage who's forgotten a lie, which is instantly compelling. And the, the, you know, the reveal will happen later, but you don't have to be invested in the story or anything that's happening yet on the, on the, the selling point of this, this, I'm a famous character. And that's why this is important or this is, that's why this is a cool story. It's just actually like a very just human moment. Um, so I, I think that story kind of encapsulates that the craft of trying to do that, of um, not relying on, you know, I'm doing Liza, you know, <laughs> like it's just, it, that's becomes almost a secondary part because you're learning, oh, that person is just like me. You know, I, I only know the, the mythical version of them, but so. Anyway, I just want to add that. Yeah. But can you do Liza for the rest of this chat? <laughs> right. I, <laughs> I um, could never do I could never do her better than her. That that's fair <laughs> enough. I was gonna say too though, I mean, I will agree with your point is these stories, if you change the names and took out the reference, the, the direct references, these are excellent stories. And so those historical elements almost just like frosting. And I don't yeah. mean that 
positive. Like, I mean, yeah. it, it's an added reward and they were the inspiration. And I mean, if the two elements combined, they're not essential to each other, but combined, they're really effective in amplifying the whole effect too. So I think it's a really, a really, anyway, I've loved the technique in both books. So Thank you. I'm a fan. Um, <laughs> I did just want to ask one question, going back to the fact that this is a 10 years of, of work in your life. You have a time machine. Yeah. What would you go back and tell younger Phil before he began writing the first of these stories? You know, I think I might tell myself to not spend as much time researching. <laughs> I don't know. I, I there, there are t the second book took a little bit longer than it should have just because I, I would get down real big rabbit holes of research. And I guess that's a good thing because, you know, you don't use it all, but it's all sort of there in your bank while you're writing it. Um, but I, I, I might have taken a little bit too long with the research on this one. Um, I'm saying this to myself. I'm answering this question like this because I want to tell myself like right now as I start researching my, my novel to, to kind of like, remember, you have to write, <laughs> you know. Um, so maybe write more research a little bit less or have it a little bit more um, balanced. Um, for me in particular, the actual writing of a lot of this book happened very quickly. And the research part was the long months, sometimes years long slog. Um, but that's sometimes just how I write. I don't know. I think the balance of research and um, writing. <laughs> Well, that's helpful because I've, I've heard people say, uh, other writers say that sometimes they end up using research as an excuse not to write because- Yeah, I think I was for a while. There's no risk in research. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it's part of the writing process, but it's the part without risk. So if you spend like, I've learned all these facts and it's contributing to the eventual product. Right. I don't have to worry about the product yet. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My thing is to research until I get bored with research. And that fortunately I'm a person who does get bored with research. So I will, okay. my research yeah. will always end at, at some point. Yeah, I feel for these stories, I pull from so many different kinds of research that like there's always something more. Um, so I think I, I, could, I never really got bored. <laughs> what are you looking for in research? Because again, these aren't, these aren't deep histories. You know, we're not, you're not, facts are not throwing us, you know, smacking us in the face constantly. So what is the thing you're looking right. for when you research? I have to really essentialize for myself the person and I don't start the stories until I feel like I really, really know the person. Um, so that part. And then also I do a lot of research where, you know, if I have a story set in 1983 or something, you know, the first, the Halston story in my first book, I, I watch movies from like that year. I watch, I listen to the music, I pull up you know, magazines. I have I have old issues of um, Christopher Street, the famous gay periodical, um, and I, I got a whole bunch of free issues at Outright one year, and just just looking at the ads and just like just all of that just adds to sort of the I call it the palette of the times, um, and it just I think that why, one of the reasons that these stories have been so successful is that I've been able to kind of really in a in a in a more like a less obvious way kind of place the time period and I, I without overbearingly slapping you with you know you know yeah. details that are just too obvious I, I don't know I, I really love the kind of slow painting of um the time period because mm -hmm. people you know people spoke differently um to slang was different it's just um I really I hate that when I'm reading a book that's like historical fiction and it's like, oh no, they wouldn't say that. That wasn't even a term yet. You know, just anachronisms like really bother me. So I do a lot of um, research to not have that happen <laughs> in my own I work. Think, I think too that one of the 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 maybe beginner mistakes uh, in in writing something historical. Mm -hmm. It's trying to show really hard that it is historical. Yeah. The people living in the moment don't view it as historical because they were living it in the moment. 
and you actually betray your characters by putting too much of a historical present lens on on the historical past. So exactly. And you can, another thing I think you're great at is not not doing that at all. So thank you. I mean, I this came up in another interview that I did, but there's a moment in the first story of At Danceteria by Halston. It's called where Liza Minnelli, let's, we have to have a Liza moment now. So she enters the story, she comes into his apartment and you, the, you know, the narrator describes, or it, it's Halston observing it, but the clank that her Bakelite bracelets make, she's wearing these two Bakelite bracelets. And that's a very specific sound when Bakelite clanks against Bakelite. It's like this, it's a clank, you know? And I feel like just that, sound like that gate that gives you early 80s like right there um so it, it's it's something that's sort of like s- not subtle but kind of micro as that um can really can that can set that can set a time period just as easily as you know this song was playing in the background <laughs> um so that's an <laughs> example of how i did that this song and also the this song was playing in the background is the easy answer for setting a time frame. Yeah. And the easy not that I is- not that I don't do that throughout these stories. <laughs> I will I do. Um, but you just you can't that can't be it. You have to have more than that. Yeah, and I don't think you don't use that as the way you set the time frame. Right. And so the 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 easy, simple, obvious solution is probably not the literary solution. Right. So yeah, yep. that's that's helpful. Uh, so going to the chat, we do have one of one question in the chat so far. So for the very first book, which I will now hold up and also encourage people to purchase, um, for At Dance Ateria, how did you keep hope alive and how did you choose beta readers? I guess, how did you keep, you know, this forward process, this forward progress as a writer, as you are waiting for, I guess, the rewards of publication? Nancy, is that sort of what you're going for? You can, I can, yeah, she's nodding. Oh, how did I keep hope alive? of what as a writer like oh trying to get published trying to work towards a published book and things like that got it yeah um you know it's, it's really hard sometimes of course um i at danceateria was actually kind of sh- a couple of the stories were shoved into what would be later become my second book and i had been trying to shop that book around i mean i was rejected by thousands it was just like um I think it's just do not stop. Uh, Hope, hope is cheap. Uh, uh, Sweat equity and just perseverance. That's kind of like, hope is always there for me. Um, But I think just kind of never never giving up is really um, the kind of mantra I would go with. And, you know, someone, my, my editor for this, you know, my publisher finally, saw what what could be with those stories and encouraged me to write a couple of more so there even would be a book i mean he actually it was his idea for me to even put them in a book so uh i think just never stop you know the struggle is real the struggle goes on (laughs) and and also I, i i try i've always tried and not always successfully to separate the mechanical process of submitting work and trying to get published from the creative process of creating the work and the closer they are the worse my writing is so like the more like honestly like that this phase of my writing career now is actually the hardest to separate the two because Mm. now i'm supposed to continue publishing as opposed to like maybe i'll be published well, I write these things. So it's actually a little harder now for me yeah. than it was for my entire, up till now. Now I, now I get the publishing side of things like, you know, oh, my, my agent didn't automatically love this manuscript. It's never going to find a home. Do I even want to work on it? You know, things like that never occurred to me five years ago. Now enter my head sometimes and it's obnoxious and I hate it. So yeah. brains, brains suck is the answer. <laughs> well, and I would also say that every time you get a rejection, like send it out to three more people. Like, just a constant, you know, it, yeah. it will land where it's supposed to land, yeah. you know? And I found, I, I, I happened to find this just perfect person that got what I was doing, who he encouraged me to write this book. And I wasn't even really going to write this book, but he was like, I think we need to do another one. I was like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> I do have some other ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm so glad he did now because, you know, 
I, I wouldn't necessarily have kept writing them. Mm -hmm. um, I thought the I thought at at Danceteria was kind of it was done. Um, I had a couple of ideas for other ones, but I wasn't really like, oh, they should have gone in there. Um, but you just, I think it'll find the right home, so. So the part, second part of that question from the chat was, how do you choose, how did you choose beta readers? So who were your readers? How did you, just, did, did you share this work with other people before you were sending it off to uh, publication? I mean, I have my sort of MFA cohort, um, a couple of people from that those days, but there are, there are some people who are completely, actually not, some of them are not even really in the writing world at all, who have read every one of these stories and read them first. Um, I, there are some people who just really get what I'm doing with these stories and were, were giving me really, really great um, feedback and so I, I have a select and, and you know, they're, they're thanked in the acknowledgement section. <laughs> there's some names that are in both of the books that, you know, that's who they are. <laughs> um, but there's just, you have to find those. That's actually one of the most important things to have because um, you just can't write in a vacuum. Um, you have to get, especially when you're with these, your own writing for so long and you completely become like desensitized to it. Like, you know, it's that moment where you're like, something that you really like that you wrote, you read it one day and it's like horrible. And it's like, okay, you need to, you know, back away, <laughs> give it to somebody else and just let, cause they're not as in it as you are and they can see it a little bit more objectively. So you have to find those people. Um, and you know, not everyone's opinion needs to be noted. <laughs> you know, some people are, <laughs> You know, you have to find the people that you not not just not just not like only find the people who are telling you good stuff, but just who are giving you the right kind of um, revisions and critiques that you you need as a writer. There are some people that you know are just not going to be helpful, so just you know punch and delete. I mean, I think that's that's like such a valuable skill is learning yeah. how to recognize who gives you the feedback you need. Yes, the feedback that helps you improve something. I think that was one of the things I really learned in my MFA program, because it was just like, oh, wow, yeah. You don't have to take everyone's criticism. Like some of them are just wrong. <laughs> Sometimes they're very wrong. Yeah, and yeah. that's okay to say. <laughs> um, so- You can see that I was very popular back then. <laughs> <laughs> You're the most popular. You're wrong, next. <laughs> Um, so I've now read 13 of the stories in these two collections, and I'm, I'm very impressed how you select and imagine your scenes. A lot of the stories happen in one or two scenes. A few of them have a slightly larger scenic structure. So there also tend to be portraits of scenes, a lot of them, not exclusively. Oh, or, but so it's not like a super long story with 50 scenes. They tend to be shorter stories with one, two, maybe three scenes. So, but I, I'm really impressed with how you select those scenes and how you execute those scenes. So how do you in, so we talked about a little bit about getting into the characters through research, but how do you find the moments where you right. want to set those scenes? Um, that, and I, think, yeah. I think before we talked a little bit about Natalie, yeah. the Natalie Wood one, mm -hmm. it's not, as you get into it, you realize it is the night she is murdered yeah. But you don't necessarily know that through a lot of the scenes. So it's it's a moment yeah. that is detached. It's one of those little secret rewards that we talked about before. It's right. detached from that, though. The scene happens without any of that. And then there's sort of an added bonus if you know the history, which I didn't right. know deeply, but I've like sensed it and had to go Google. So yeah. And yeah. How do you yeah. how do you how do you find the moments? Well, you know, just to use that example, um, the story is called Brainstorm. It's uh, the second story in the book. And you know, I had this idea that I wanted to write about Natalie Wood, um, specifically on that last night, but I didn't know how to get in, how to get there. Um, and actually, this is the story that I was sort of alluding to before that I just got really, really lost in the research and spent, you know, a lot of time in the research. I mean, I, I read one of the books, like I read a book twice, like about her, like I was just like, wait, I think I need to read it again. It was just, um, so that, I knew I wanted to write about that, but I wasn't necessarily sure my way into the story. Um, and I, I read um, 
you know, some biography and they were describing the night where they're, they were on the island before they get back to the yacht where like the shit goes down. Um, but it's the, it's like the dinner beforehand when they're on the island. And I was like, that's where this, that's my way in. Because that sort of, you know, gets, it eliminates the need to get really dramatic and try to be like, this is what happened at the end, you know, cause I, I didn't want to go there, but I wanted to sort of set the stage um, for what is to come. And yeah, that story, I just, I felt like that's a really interesting story because it, it started out differently than I think it ended up. Um, it, it kind of became the story about domestic violence um, in a way that it did not start out as. Um, but as I, I was, I felt like I was investigating a cold case and I love like real, you know, real life, true crime. So I, you know, I found out all this stuff and I was like, oh, wow. Like, I think this happened. And, you know, that was going into the story. I, I, that's, that's always there. Um, but again, the story is also just about a very drunken night of, you know, people just going crazy. Um, so that, um, that moment just kind of came to me through the research. Um, but, you know, I have to just, I have to find my way, I, my way in. I, I, sometimes I just don't know what the setting is. Where are they? Like, what is the story? Um, I think I told you this before, but the, the last story in the book is uh, the director of a chorus line. And the, the, the story is about this party that they had, this Christmas party where all the people in the play are coming as the old versions of the characters they play in the, in the musical. And that was a real party that really happened in 1982. And I, you know, it was a little tiny, like three sentences in, in a book. And I was like, you know, the second I read that, I was like, bam, I've got my story. You know, I knew it. And it was, it just worked for what I wanted to, the, this, the bigger story that I wanted to tell about Michael and a chorus line. It was, it was all there. Um, so you just kind of hope for those moments where you just sort of happen into, um, the story. I mean, yeah, plot's hard. Um, and, so, and in some of these stories, it, not a lot happens actually. Um, not a lot is really happening in the Natalie Wood story. I mean, there are, there are things sort of happening in the subtext of the story, um, but fit, like if you plotted out what happens in the story, like not much. Um, so it's all, uh, for some of these stories, it's sort of what's, what's happening in the, in the corners. Um, and sometimes what's happening in the corners is AIDS. You know, AIDS is sort of hovering over here, um, especially in the chorus line story because Michael just sort of, I don't know, he has no idea sort of what's coming for him, um, but he's letting someone go. And anyway, uh, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. No, I think so. And it's interesting too, because I think you've, you've mentioned a couple different processes now. You have the Eureka moment where you found a detail that let you enter the story and, and guided you probably through, from start to finish. But then you also mentioned the Natalie story, which it didn't do what you thought it was going to do. So, right. it, so you figured that one out as you wrote, is what, am I yeah. correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's important to note too, that there's, even for the same writer, there's not the same process in terms of creating a story. Sometimes, sometimes you're like, I see this, somehow right. it went straight to the page, right. revised a few times, it's good to go. Sometimes it's, I'm going to fight this. I know I want to tell this thing. It's not working. Just can keep writing, keep writing. And at some point, you know, it's it's how many times have we turned it like submitted a manuscript to workshop or a writer's group where they said you actually start here. And it's like yeah. two pages in, uh, and all that yeah. warm up you did to get there was actually to get the point that actually had resonance. Yeah, sometimes you have to believe them. <laughs> <laughs> if you have to cut something, you can just put it aside. Like it doesn't have to like cease to exist. You know, like keep a file of just all of your writing, like even if it comes out of the story, like things things have ended up in stories that I wrote for other stories that died, you know, mm -hmm. like just never get rid of your own work, <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying. Like, just don't, don't like highlight it all and just like delete. That's, so that's sometimes usually, you can keep that stuff. <laughs> that's usually my process. 
I know. Delete it. Kill it. Throw it away. Yeah. I don't save it. <laughs> Sometimes you keep it. It's gone. <laughs> um. So so in in creating these characters, we talked about uh, um, the fact that they are these are based on real people, real celebrities. Um, but they're definitely fictionalized versions of those celebrities. You're not trying to tell, you're not trying to give up. This is not biographical. No. First of all, there's material in here that no biography could possibly have access to. In the Elizabeth example you read, we're in her head that mm -hmm. entire time. So this yeah. panicky moment on the stage turns into this interior thought process by, by the character. So how do right. you, how do you balance research and imagination? Because I really think you know, the research is interesting and you're really good at it and you get sucked into it. But the thing that makes this good, I mean, great writing is is the imagination, the, your ability to imagine what Elizabeth Taylor might yeah. be thinking as she's yeah. she's crossing the stage to kill time while she's trying to get get her head back to the line she's trying to remember. Right. I think it just really goes back down to just treating them as characters. Um, and not, I'm not trying to necessarily be like, well, what, what would, what would Elizabeth Taylor possibly be thinking here? Um, it's more like, well, what would this character who has forgotten a line be thinking right here? And if that, if there's something that weaves in from her life that I know about, maybe through my research that might come in, but, um, I think my allegiance to them is as characters, as they would be of any character that I just wrote from my own original work that I created out of my head, you know, it's, it's, um, so I, I don't think it's ever really like, I'm never, I guess I am, I mean, I am imagining what they would say in these, in certain situations, but I, I don't, I, I try to not do a ventriloquist act, if that makes sense. It's not my, it's, it's never my goal because I actually don't ever want to be totally constricted by that um and the imagination only works if it's unencumbered you know mm -hmm. so the, the you have to throw out this rule that well you know she would never think that she would never say that it's just like well you know what my version of her will you know it's 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 that's why they're i don't i that's why we can refer to them as my you know my characters because this is my this is my version of this person which is all anyone, you know, that's what, that's what you're getting in a biography too, by the way. I mean, that's the biographer's version of whoever. It's, it's not, you're never going to get the complete person unless you're getting, unless you're really reading like a hardcore, like autobiography that's totally in their voice. And, but even then they're, they're they might be hiding something, you, you know, it, and that's why you have to go to multiple sources to find out who these people are. Like, even when I read like Maureen Stapleton's autobiography, I felt like I knew her so well and I knew the kind of language that she actually would use in dialogue. And I think that's what makes her kind of pop in the story. But I think, you know, what, what is Maureen, what did Maureen let, leave off the page of her own story? Um, and, you know, that's, that's always, fun for the a writer who's attempting a project like this because I can say things that the 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 actor would maybe never reveal um which is part of the fun I guess um especially if these characters are dead and they're you know they're maybe people don't know them as much and maybe they're sort of on their way to being forgotten or something um it's just this this sort of chance to breathe life into them um in my way like they're my character or they're my version of that character. Um, so sp thinking of characters, when you're beginning to create a character, and, and this is any character, whether it's one, you know, based on or inspired by a true person or a character that you're, you're starting from scratch, what is the first thing or what are the first things you're thinking about in creating that character? What draws you to create the character, a character in the first place? I think voice like the voice what kind of language they would use that really is the first sort of building block for me because language is, has, is just so important to me I think the language of the description of the character and and you know the dialogue that they use it all has to kind of be in the same palette um that you've you're you're kind of 
you know, and sometimes you have to write it out to get to that point, of course. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I think the first thing that popped in my head is language. It's just, it's the, it just has to be the right. Mm -hmm. I mean, thing, I think you, you know? I think the Elizabeth excerpt, excerpt, you're definitely getting that, that there's certainly a voice that sounds specific to that character that's being revealed. And, and this yeah. is, this, it's not a first person narration. So there is right. an author over top of her voice reporting yeah. her thoughts. So it's yeah. not just her, her, but there are flashes of that and flashes of her self-perception, I think, that really come through there, which are really interesting to me as well. And I think the Halston story, I don't know why I keep bringing that one up, but the the narrator in that is very closely aligned with Halston. Um, his yeah. way of, the speaking, the the catty, bitchy kind of observational observations. Um, it, it's, it's those, it's that, I think that's an example of what I'm trying to say is that that, that language really is painting that character as much as, a description or you know anything but like that I, I think it's also interesting though to because these stories hold up really well together because there is something of the narrator the narratorial holding voice holding it together how do you balance your voice as writer as as narrator versus hmm. what what is that element of your voice that comes in to sort of hold everything together uh, versus the individual voices of the characters, especially the ones when you're inside their their heads. Ooh, Ooh I mean, I got a hard one. That was off the cuff. That's so. hard. I was like, oh. Uh, well, you know, the first thing that popped into my head is, you know, in both of these stories, there is one story that does not have any famous people or celebrities. Um, it's sort of the main, the, and it's always in the middle of the book. And it's sort of the, the man on the street kind of view of the same time period the average regular person, you know, what's going on down here. Um, and I think in both of these books that the voice of that, those stories is probably the closest you're getting to Phil <laughs> um, because they are maybe a little bit like closer to me, those, those characters, I feel like possibly, I don't know. Um, the voice probably came a little bit easier for those stories than others. Um, but I think, yeah, I think, Ooh, I don't know. I, 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 can I take a pass on that one? Yeah, I, I don't even know. I don't know how to answer it. It's just, it's so, it's just so like, not like definable to me. Yeah, that's good. And I also, I'm going to go back and read those middle two, those middle two stories to, to read them like psychoanalytically about you from now on. I'm just going to go yeah, back. Right. I just, I think I just gave away too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, and I'm more really talking about this new book. Um, okay. I, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot more, there's a lot of me in this book uh, that would be, and it's not necessarily just in that story. Mm -hmm. um, like I gave myself in some ways. So I guess maybe this does sort of answer the question. I, I mean, I gave myself, to a lot of these characters. Like some of them even have some of my own stories, you know, mm -hmm. um, that I've just decided to give to, you know, this famous person. Um, but, so there is a kind of melding that happened with this book in some ways. Um, but this is, I think this is a, this is a much more personal book um, for me than at Dance of Tyria was in a, mm -hmm. in a way. So I asked what the first thing you think about when creating a character is, but now I'm curious, what's the last thing you tweak with the character during the revision process? What are the things you notice? If, what are the things you, you really want to polish mm. uh, before you send a story off for publication? You know, well, there's this one thing that I kind of do always, but you have to kill your babies. <laughs> so there's little things that have you, and it's like that, those little things that pop up during your read through your, and it's, it's almost this, they're almost the same every time your fifth read through and your 50th. There's always these little things that you're really proud of maybe like they sound really great, but they never quite work. And you just, you, you know, as a writer, you just know it doesn't work. You're, you're, you're kind of, you're like, I'm always like, well, I wrote it. Like, why would I, <laughs> why would I take it out? It's like, you know, I, I put time into that. <laughs> um, and I think my, my final edit is going through those things that I know have not worked the whole time, but I've been too scared to cut. Um, so I definitely, I remember when I did that revision for this book, 
you know, I knew exactly the places to go. Cause I was like, nope, that doesn't work. and never has, you know, you can just tell. And I think you develop that, that sense as you just develop as a writer. Um, so killing babies. And then that's what I call it. Uh, or kill your darlings. I think that's what my- I like, I like yours better. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm thinking of the T.C. Boyle short story, Killing Babies, which is an amazing story. Um, I think that I don't needs know to be, it, but I'll look it up. Um, needs to be reread right now, I think, with um, some recent events that are happening in the world. But um, I, yeah. So Killing Babies, Killing Darlings. Um, and then I always pay attention really to the last thing that the character says in the story. If they're the last, the last bit of dialogue or the last two or three lines of dialogue um, are always, it's, it's something that the um, reader is going to remember because just, just by nature of it being at the end. And it really always has to kind of like land. Um, so I always make sure that the last bit of dialogue is really on point. Um, but that's just me. That's just a personal thing. Um, you know, what else um yeah, i love yeah. that one i love that one because that's that's i've not heard that phrase exactly i mean obviously you want all your dialogue to be good but right it's not just that, that the dialogue is good but that it's the right dialogue for for that moment yes like the the concluding dialogue has a different function and a different role than the other dialogue exactly that's interesting to me so all right um, we have another question from the chat right. uh, a publishing question and I actually don't know this. Did you find an agent first to help you find the publisher or were you published without an agent? I don't have an agent. I've never had an agent. Um, yeah, I, I think I alluded to this earlier, but um, I was publishing the stories that eventually became at Danceteria um, individually in um, a gay male fiction journal uh, that was run by um, Raymond Luxac, who is my publisher, uh, Squares and Rebels. And he published, you know, four of them in four separate issues of this magazine. And then he came to me with this idea of doing a whole book of them. Uh, but he was like, you have to write three more. Uh, and luckily I had some material like in my head, like ready to go. Um, so I had some ideas, but um, I really, I, I, yeah, I never had an agent. It happened very kind of organically. And then he, you know, wanted me to write another book. So it, it, I never really, I got lucky that way. And then actually um, I was doing a podcast interview to promote at Danceteria. And I mentioned my unpublished manuscript, which is basic, which was basically my MFA thesis. Um, and I was describing a story that was in that and a publisher contacted me and said, you know, I really like that story. Like, you know, where is it? And I was like, well, it's already been published in a magazine, but it's part of this larger manuscript, <laughs> uh, which they end ended up publishing. So I got very lucky in that way, um, just by the happenstance of it. But I I, I don't know, I, I've, I've, I've contacted many agents. Um, I've, I've always been rejected. Even after the, even after my first two books were, you know, quite critically successful. Um, they still didn't say, yeah. Um, so I'm just going to keep going without the agent. I think I'm doing fine with that one. <laughs> I'm going to become an agent so I can represent you. <laughs> I would love, I would love to be your client. <laughs> um, so uh, one more question from the chat. I think we have time for before we wrap up. How did you decide to write a book of stories based on famous people? I mean, we, it wasn't necessarily a full decision, but maybe how did you decide to write these stories? Um, and that you also include the, the, the stories about the man on the street. And did you start writing about fictional characters first? Um, right. So. No, it was definitely celebrities right from the get-go. Um, and, you know, I am such a like, t like old movie, just pop culture TV person. So I love celebrities. Like I love like old, you know, black and white movies. I love like, you know, silent film era star drama you know I, I just so I, that was a very natural kind of place for me to go and it's just very fun for me to write about that um and I just really had never considered doing it and I just I, once I started doing it I was like this is like fun 
because you get to kind of play in a way um, and just kind of engage with engage with history in um, a way that hasn't been done as much. Um, and then when I when I kind of found the way in of this larger early days of AIDS story, um, it seemed like a really interesting viewpoint that I hadn't really seen done, which is exploring those early days of AIDS through this sort of celebrity lens. And what does that look like? Um, and like, why celebrities? Um, but my, actually my professor sort of answered this question to me. She was like, the celebrities have this inherent doubleness. Um, they're, they're at once overexposed and almost too known to us, but yet at the same time, I'm almost quoting her right now, yet at the same time, like completely unknowable to us. So I loved, I love her, the, her, I love the way that she verbalized that because I feel like that kind of, that's the reason I kept coming back to these is that, that, un, that unknowable quality of this famous person that you feel like you know so well is what I, what I really tried to kind of bring out um, in, in this story. So um, I think that answers that. Yeah, that's great. And Phil, I think we've reached the end and I just want to thank you again so much for joining us to everyone who's here. Thank please, you for everyone for coming. Go find <laughs> copies of the books and the third one that's over my shoulder. Um, uh, Philip Dean Walker, everyone. Phil, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and we hope we'll see you again at the next. Thanks for having me. Thank you for having me.